Good afternoon, Trinity Tigers. Welcome to the Learning Together Live webinar series. The series is uh, one of the lifelong learning initiatives presented by Trinity University's Office of Alumni Relations. I'm Robert Rivard, the publisher and editor of the nonprofit Rivard Report here in San Antonio, and the university has invited me to moderate today's webinar. Our subject is the future of Trump, the impact of the 2018 midterm elections. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to converse on this important topic with Dr. David Crockett, professor and chair of political science at Trinity University. Dr. Crockett has taught at Trinity University since 1999. His primary teaching and research initiatives and interests include the American presidency, elections and campaign, classical political philosophy, American political developments, and American political thought. Professor Crockett will discuss the, mod the midterm election results and how they will impact national politics in the months to come. And throughout the program, we'll be taking your questions and weaving them into the conversation. Professor Crockett, great to be with you today. Good to be here. And let's just hear how did the midterm elections from your perspective unfold? So I thought I'd just kind of run through the basic facts and context of what happened, and then we can see where the questions go from there. Uh, at the House level, the Democrats, of course, this is an evolving process right now, but it looks like they picked up at least 30 to 35 seats. That'll probably lead to a roughly 230-205 split in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, Republicans have picked up two. Uh, we don't have final results from Arizona, and there's now a question about Florida, so that could go up to three or down to one. But I'm going to go ahead and say plus two, which gives you a 53-47 split in the Senate. And uh, the governorships, Democrats picked up seven seats. Republicans still control 26 governorships, uh, so there's a slight edge for them nationwide. Some interesting things happened on Tuesday. It looks like we're going to have a record over 100 women in Congress now for the first time. Turnout approached presidential year voting, not quite there, but approached that. In 2014, we had turnout of 36 percent. It looks like turnout this year is 49 percent. So that's very, very good for a midterm election. Big picture, I looked at uh, 21 midterms since 1934, and the President's party typically loses about 27 seats in a midterm election in the House. So losing 30 to 35 is kind of well within the normal range. I wouldn't call that a wave or a tsunami, but kind of a normal midterm loss effect. Uh, gaining two in the Senate is a little bit unusual, but there, there have been four examples since 1934 of the President's party picking up a couple of seats. Uh, a couple days ago, and it looked like it might be four, I would have said that was really unusual, but it looks like it might be only two, and that would be good, but not great, especially when you factor in the structural features of the Senate this year where so many Democrats were defending seats in Trump won states. So uh, you might expect Republicans to pick up s seats, but overall kind of a mixed result. Some interesting exit poll data in the 18 and 29 year group, which most of my students are in, two to one for Democrats. Also Democrats did great in the minority communities. In states where Trump's job approval is positive, the co-partisans uh, did very well in Senate races. And in those states where his approval ratings were not that high, they did not achieve excellence. Um, at the state government level, we're looking now at 23 states that have unified Republican control of both houses of, of the legislature and the governorship, 14 states with unified Democratic control, 13 split. At the state level, the Texas congressional delegation will still be dominated by Republicans, but they lost two seats, maybe a third. We'll see what happens in District 23. So that goes from a 25 to 11 Republican majority to a 23-13 split with District 23 still uh, not settled yet. In the Texas legislature, Republicans in the House have gone from 100 to 99 to 95, now to 83. Democrats picked up 12 seats in the Texas uh, House, so that's down from the 2010 peak. And they picked up two Texas Senate seats, so we have a 19 to 11 split in the Texas Senate, which allows Dan Petrick to do what he wants to do, just barely. Uh, Republicans have still won all statewide races, and that's been the, the story since 1994. So we're going into a quarter century where Democrats have not been able to win a statewide race. However, the uh, silver lining for Democrats 
is in the area of the, the gap in the uh, victories. Uh, most statewide races see double-digit Republican victories in recent years. Uh, Greg Abbott did that, 13 plus percent victory. Uh, our land commissioner, George P. Bush, uh, broke 10 percent. And those are solid margins for Republicans. But the highest profile race was obviously the Senate race between Cruz and O'Rourke, and Cruz squeaked out a victory with less than 3 percent. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, only 5 percent of a, vict a victory margin. Uh, Agricultural Commissioner Sid Miller, less than 5%. Ken Paxton for the Attorney General, less than 4%. So when you think back just six years ago, Cruz won his first race for the Senate by 16%, and now it's less than three. I think you've got some interesting warning signs for Republicans in the state. And if I compare Cruz, uh, compare Abbott and Bush, who won by double digits, where you have this sort of a, an image of competence to Cruz and Patrick, who are sometimes seen as edgy, maybe bomb throwers, Miller and Paxton, who have various degrees of controversy asso associated with them, they're the ones who are very low single digits. Um, that might be an interesting thing to think about if you're a Republican looking at the future, because Republicans have been slowly losing ground over the last few years. Finally, in terms of what this looks like for the future, I would just want to point out that midterms are not a good predictor of presidential elections, but we do now have divided government. Trump has his tax cut. That's not going to go away, and I think he will continue to pursue deregulation through the executive branch, so he doesn't need the House to do that. But it's unclear where he gets the money to build the wall, because you have to have uh, House bills to fund things, and Democrats now have investigative power, impeachment power, oversight power that uh, they can use against Trump in the next two years. On the other hand, Republicans have strengthened their majorities in the Senate, so I'm not sure I see much room for compromise here, and certainly Mitch McConnell has every incentive to continue pushing for judicial nominations, and if you're concerned about that, you send a prayer up for Ruth Bader Ginsburg's health, since she's in the hospital after a bad fall this week. Uh, that could be something that uh, we see in the next couple of years. In 2020, in the Senate, we'll see the reverse of what happened this year. This year, there are twice as many Democrats defending seats as Republicans. In 2020, there are 22 Republicans defending seats against only 12 Democrats. I took a look at who is actually up for a re-election in 2020. There's one obviously weak Democrat, and that's going to be Alabama Senator Doug Jones. Uh, he's on life support there. On the Republican side, Cory Gardner of Colorado would certainly be seen as at risk, and Susan Collins has one big heap honking target on her back in Maine. So those would be the two Republicans I would think would be at most at risk in 2020. Of course, the big thing is the presidential election. Everything has now been teed up for 2020. I'm going to assume Trump's going to run for re-election. He's already publicly picked Pence to be his running mate again, and I'm not sure I see an internal challenge. Nothing about what happened on Tuesday indicates that that would be taken very seriously. But the process for Democrats has already begun. Uh, I think the Democratic caucuses in the House and the Senate will be more liberal than they have been. And the primary process will continue to push the party to the left. And at the risk of being the bearer of bad news, the February 3rd, 2020 Iowa caucuses are only 15 months away, followed one month later by the March 3rd Super Tuesday, which will include both Texas and California. And that means by this summer, we will be in the middle of Democratic Party primary debates that could involve as many as 30 people. So the dilemma for Democrats is who runs, what are the lanes they're running in, how do you sort that out to get down to a sensible number, and who can beat Trump for re-election. And in a final word, I took a look at the Electoral College and just did some gaming here. If you look at the states that Romney and Trump both won, Republicans are at 206 out of a necessary 270 to win the presidency. If you look at the states that both Obama and Hillary Clinton won, Democrats start off at 229. That gives you 103 electoral votes in the swing states. Looking at Tuesday's results, and then this is very, very speculative, but if you give Trump the states that he won statewide elections in, presumably in Florida, Florida and Ohio push Republicans up to 253, throw in Iowa, you're at 259. However, Democrats won Michigan and Wisconsin. Those are two states that Trump won in 2016. 
That puts Democrats at 255. I'll throw them New Hampshire because it makes a very nice and elegant 259-259 tie with Pennsylvania being ground zero for 2020. It's not a prediction, but I think it's very uh, interesting, and I think we're in for a really wild time for the next two years. So that's sort of my rundown of the, the basic facts. Well, now we're all going to be watching Pennsylvania for two years <laughs> because you told us to, and we're not going to we're not going to be able to help ourselves. We'll come back to state politics a little bit later in the program, but I do want to <clears throat> explore a little bit uh, further the balance of power going forward in in the nation's capital. The Senate, of course, uh, the Republicans did pick up two seats, but they already had effective control of the Senate, not on every issue, but they had the majority. Uh, in the House of Representatives, however, we saw more Democrats pick up seats than any time I remember uh, since Watergate, which is going back quite a ways. So it wasn't a wave, but it was significant. And what does it mean to the balance of power? Are we in just for two years of gridlock and them thwarting, thwarting Trump? Uh, can, can the Democrats actually push any legislation forward with the hope of getting it through to the Senate or even just getting it through the House for political reasons on issues like immigration, health care, uh, other, other topics? So if the goal is to pass legislation, which means a presidential signature, there are issues that have been there for a couple of years where the president could forge alliances uh, with Democrats and Republicans on perhaps infrastructure, some of his more iconoclastic views about trade uh, might feed into both parties, but you have to have a House and a Senate willing to play ball. And I haven't seen much from future House committee leaders that indicates they're enthusiastic about that when several people are saying, you won these elections so that you can hold the president accountable. So I, it's possible something can happen there, but House Democrats have every incentive to make the path for a Democratic presidential candidate easier in 2020, and that is going to mean holding Trump's feet to the fire when it comes to oversight. And I don't know if I were a Democrat, I would advise impeachment. That has all sorts of treacherous aspects to it, but oversight is not a hard thing to do, and they will control all the committees that do that. So uh, I think they could make the president's life very uncomfortable in that area. Uh, they can very easily pass legislation to go to the Senate to die. And then your argument there would be, we have passed these things, so you need to elect Democrats in both houses of Congress and give us a Democratic president. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at the polls and see kind of what kind of issues are really popular. They could certainly uh, uh, play that game. Well, impeachment does seem extreme at this, certainly at this juncture, but containment doesn't. Mm -hmm. Can, can, can uh, Democrats uh, controlling the House actually reverse things like the 2018 budget allocation for the wall being built in the Rio Grande Valley? Uh, there's enough money that they've already started construction down there, or is what's already happened uh, up till now pretty much protected and, and will go forward, and it's only their ability to stop um, further funding in the future. So what's happening right now is, is baked into the proverbial cake, and keep in mind Republicans still control the House for another two months, yeah. almost two months. And I don't know what that means in terms of what they might try to do. Uh, they may try to push through a spending bill for more wall building, uh, I, I don't know, but come January, there's no reason for Democrats to help the president out on things they find offensive when it comes to spending bills, which means he would have to try to find creative ways to use budgetary power to carve out money for wall building, for example. And there are also, you know, we have since the New Deal seen an executive branch acquire power, allowing a president to act on his discretion without the need of Congress in a variety of areas. And we saw that move forward with George W. Bush and Barack Obama did, did not back off on that and Donald Trump is not backing off on that. So to a certain extent, we have to live in the house that we've built and that is a house that has a lot of discretionary authority for the president to do things. And the best way for Congress to stop that is passing laws and you're not gonna see much of that with a divided Congress. So looking at that 60-day period before um, the House does change hands, President Trump wasted no time the morning after the elections in, uh, in um, firing Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Do you see him making, uh, taking the next step or his new Attorney General, uh, acting Attorney General doing so against the special uh, investigation of, uh, of Mueller or um, 
would that provoke a crisis in your view and, and one that uh, Trump's advisors wisely will prevent him from, from doing? They'll try to prevent him from doing that. I don't know that I feel comfortable predicting what the president would do at this stage, but certainly not encouraging the Mueller investigation, trying to encourage it to come to a conclusion. Um, he has several times said he's not staying in the way of that, but he thinks there, you know, there's no collusion, so bring it to a conclusion. And, and if that happens quickly, I think this might blow over, depending on what the, the results are. Uh, but if you were to make the move to do something more aggressive, you have an infrastructure in place in the House come January to keep that in the public eye for the next two years. And uh, like I say, that could that could make life difficult for him. The subpoena power uh, is something House members, I think, would be willing to use. No challenges to um, Nancy Pelosi to be the next Speaker of the House? It doesn't seem so. You know, with uh, if the Democrats hit say 235, she can't afford to lose too many people. And there were a dozen or so Democrats who said, I'm not going to vote for her. But it looks like that's been tamped down for the moment. And uh, we'll see what happens when they actually have the House caucus meet. But I suspect that, you know, when, if you are the leader of your caucus and you win, you got to get rewarded with what you want, which would be speakership for her. So I suspect that she will be able to keep that position uh, but I think the days are numbered, probably. There are a lot of brand-new Democrats who want to see a different leadership structure. So let's bring it back to Texas for a few minutes. The, uh, the campaign of former congressman, or, well, he's still a congressman, Beto O'Rourke uh, from El Paso, uh, challenging Ted Cruz, was seen uh, as quixotic in the beginning, but uh, it took on steam that captivated the energy, imagination, and funding uh, of a national audience. And he gave Senator Cruz a real run for his money yeah, he did. by, what, three points or less than three points. So I guess we could say in some ways, even in losing, he won, Beto won, in terms of becoming a national phenomena. And for a Democratic Party that hasn't had a strong personality or individual emerge in the Trump era to uh, take on Trump, Beto has certainly emerged as somebody that's, that's, that's galvanized people nationally and brought out millennial voters, new voters, et cetera. What, what do you see as the aftermath of his campaign in Texas leading to? Well, one obvious thing is it shows Democrats that it's not a given for Republicans to win. On the one hand, it's obviously a moral victory. But moral victories are only partially satisfying because they still lost every single statewide race, but the margins are, are, are significantly smaller. And so I think you see what has to be done to win, what still has to be done. Uh, someone as uh, controversial and arguably unpopular as Ted Cruz, uh, um, that's the kind of opponent you would want as a Democrat, whereas someone like Greg Abbott uh, was is much more difficult to take out, although his competition was not nearly as strong. Uh, so I think you have a potential roadmap for Democrats, especially given the fact that O'Rourke, as I understand the election returns, won places like Tarrant County, Hayes County, and Williamson County. These are counties that Republicans can't afford to cede to Democrats in the long term. You, you, you can only win with rural, rural votes so far when Texas at the urban level looks very similar to the country as a whole. And so when you win traditionally Republican strongholds like Williamson County and Tarrant County, that doesn't bode well. And as you see demographic, demographic changes in uh, Texas in the next few years as uh, a very young Latino community becomes old enough to vote, um, that's going to be interesting to watch how Republicans respond. As far as O'Rourke's future, the last person to successfully run for the presidency from the House was James Garfield. Right. So it's not a great <laughs> launching pad for that. Nothing would stop him from this race moving on to another statewide race in two years. Maybe he'll decide to take on John Cornyn. Uh, but that's something he has to sort of decide for himself. Um, I think it's difficult to run for the presidency from a loss at a lower level. It's happened before, most famously Abraham Lincoln, perhaps, uh, different era. Uh, but he has a, he's a young guy who has a future in front of him, and he has to sort of decide what is that line? Do you try this again, or maybe go for statewide office and try to 
show Democrats what that future looks like. Uh, but Republicans are not going to take that sitting down. They know what the weakness is and know what they have to think about in 2020 and 2022 and, of course, Ted Cruz in 2024. Uh, so every, uh, there's very much a clockwork universe or a Newtonian universe for politics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, but you see what Democrats have to do. There's a three to five point gap still to overcome. Um, but the progress is being made. And so if you're a Democrat, as demoralizing as the results might be, I would argue that O'Rourke overperformed and show Democrats what is possible given the right circumstances. The question, I think, though, for the party in the state is what the Democratic Party is whether Beto is something of a one off mm -hmm. situation, both for his Bobby Kennedy like um, uh, presence that he generated everywhere, and also Ted Cruz, let's face it, is one of the most unlikable <laughs> office holders within his own party, kind of a pariah in the Senate before he ran for president humiliated uh, by Trump during the primaries and then coming back to Trump. Uh, it was a very odd thing. I listened to the uh, Texas Tribune podcast with Speaker Joe Strauss and uh, Texas Tribune CEO Evan Smith. And without coming right out and say it, um, the speaker said he did split his ticket more than he's ever done before <laughs> and that he voted more on character than political party or, or issues, which all but signals that uh, Speaker Strauss was probably a Beto vote. So. You, you just wonder who would come behind him to pick up that mantle and be able to carry it forward and continue uh, trying to turn Texas uh, from red into at least purple. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I know anecdotally of uh, friends of mine who are Republicans who had Beto signs in their yard. So that raises the interesting question, how much of this is a positive impact of O'Rourke how much of it is a negative referendum on Cruz, not just by Democrats, of course, who loathe him, but even by some Republicans who don't find him to be palatable. And that's why I think when you look at some of the statewide races, when you compare Abbott to Patrick or Cruz to Abbott to Cruz, uh, Sid Miller and Ken Paxton, uh, controversy, edginess, a stridency, a perception of perhaps um, pursuing a extreme agenda at the expense of more mainstream problems the state might face in terms of education funding and things like that, uh, candidates who look good on those areas still do very well as Republicans, and the ones who don't uh, had much closer races. So it's interesting to you know, just figure out, is this a one-off for O'Rourke? How much of that was also an impact of Cruz being a problematic candidate and we'll get an idea, I think, when Cornyn comes up in 2020 and see what kind of a challenge he draws. And we'll get a better idea of this kind of a tension between the competence idea versus straightforward, anchor faction, hardcore conservative. Uh, uh, you know, and it's not to say that Abbott is not very conservative, but there's a style or demeanor or temperance at play here that I think uh, turns some people off. Well, continuing with the, uh, the comments of Speaker Strauss, who of course is a moderate Republican and he's leaving, leaving the House, and as he said in the interview, I can now say whatever I feel like saying. I don't <laughs> represent the entire Texas House of Representatives. He said he thought the results clearly indicated that the Republican Party in the state is moving away from the Republican voters and that they're focusing too much on issues like bathroom bills and not enough on public education, um, creating jobs, the core things that really um, voters want to um, see from their legislators. And um, he suggested that uh, if that continued, the Democrats would continue to, to make inroads. So I'm wondering, as the 2019 Texas uh, session of the Texas legislature looms here starting in January, do you think the ruling party will take a um, a step back from their planned uh, uh, legislative agenda and say, we're not going to bring the bathroom bill back up. We're going to have to do something about public education. We're going to have to work with uh, a more balanced House, uh, Texas House. And will we see maybe a more productive session than we otherwise would have expected because the party will moderate a little bit? 
I guess we'll get an idea of that once the leadership is settled. I don't know how that's going to work in the Texas House because obviously you have the ability of different factions in the Republican Party to forge alliances with Democrats to uh, pick their own speaker. Um, unless they've changed that rule that it has to be all Republicans, and I'm not sure what that rule is right now, whether that's been put into place. But Dan Patrick has control over the Texas Senate. So the question is going to be for someone who's a little more uh, edgier in, in his uh, policy objectives, will he look at these results, moderate some? And it's, you know, this is all co becomes a question of definition. You can pursue a fairly conservative policy agenda, including some of these controversial social issues. The question, I think, though, for Republicans is, is that, does that become the core debate in the legislature? Is that what you are known for? And if that becomes the thing that defines it, that's where I think that you get the public relations problem. Where, and if you are ignoring then other issues that the state is confronting, uh, that's what gives your, your opposition uh, a chance. Uh, so a lot will depend not necessarily on eschewing completely the social issues that are important for a pretty significant faction of the, of the Republican Party, but what, what are you known for? What, is the, what becomes the defining debate of the legislature? And I, I would gently suggest to the Lieutenant Governor that that would be something to look at carefully. So before we leave Texas and go to some of our viewer questions and, and, and get outside the state, I think we ought to talk a little bit about the two congressional seats that were, were up for grabs in, uh, in, in our uh, voting area. One, of course, was uh, Congressman Will Hurd defending one of the most difficult districts, 21 to, or 23, excuse me, to defend. It's, it's gone back and forth and back and forth, for, uh, one cycle, election cycle after another. Uh, Gina Ortiz-Jones, a political newcomer, gave him a real run for his money. Officially, the votes are still being counted, and, and in the case of Medina County and uh, another West Texas County, I think it was Culverson, uh, they were recounted, or they weren't recounted, but they were resubmitted uh, <laughs> more in Congressman Hurd's favor. He has declared victory. Uh, l l uh, you know, Congressman Lamar Smith, after a long career, uh, retired, and um, the Democratic candidate uh, Copser in, in Joseph Copser in that uh, District 21 gave uh, Chip Roy a real run for his money, two newcomers, but they were both very competitive races. Yeah. So obviously District 23 is always competitive. Uh, it's gone back and forth. If Will Hurd can pull this one out, it'll be a three-peat, but always by a very, very narrow margin. So he has figured out some way to thread that needle and uh, have a fairly decent Republican voting record in terms of the percentage with his party while distancing himself from Trump. Uh, but it's just going to be a perennial issue, at, le at least through 2020, and we'll see what happens with uh, redistricting. The magic of the Texas legislature may try to get that seat safer for him, but uh, he'll have to win one more time. Um, so that one's always uh, competitive. The interesting one, I think, is the one that Smith was in, and uh, which is where I live, and he has always won that in a walk. And now with the, now in an open race, it always gives the opportunity for the challenging party to make a real run at it, which is what I think Copser did. It's an attractive candidate, kind of unconventional uh, military veteran. And so he made that uh, a close one. We'll have to see in 2020 whether that was because it's an open race. And with Chip Roy being an incumbent, it'll go back to 10 to 15 point victories. Or is this close race an example of Democrats closing the distance with Republicans in this state and beginning to turn less red and more purple? And time will tell. All right, um, Professor Crockett, this might be a former student of yours because Craig Mills on Facebook says, Trin Trinity University political science alumni here, alumnus, excuse me, I don't hear much <coughs> discussion about the, st the state assembly seats Democrats picked up nationally and how that Democratic governorship pickups could affect possible redistricting. Yeah, so I haven't looked at the, uh, the state <coughs> assembly seats yet. Um, I like to let a few days pass so that we get more settled because in recent election cycles, Republicans have picked up a lot there, and I would expect that that would be reversed somewhat. But this is going to be a critical thing in 2020, not so much this year, 
But in 2020, we had the census, which means whoever wins those seats, both at the gubernatorial level and the state legislature, will have a, a big say in how redistricting is done in many states after the 2020 election. Acknowledging, of course, that there were several ballot initiatives in several states that won that put the redistricting process into the hands of a neutral or bipartisan or nonpartisan panel. So the more states that do that, the less important it's going to be who the governor in the state legislature is controlled by when you have another panel, like in Iowa, doing that redistricting. But in 2020, that's going to be a big question, which is why those elections are key for that whole decade. To a certain extent, Republicans uh, in 2018, even losing 30 seats or so, are benefiting from the 2010 uh, redistricting cycle, and only now at the end of the decade are starting are, are losing that uh, that control. So who wins in 2020 will say a lot about what happens for redistricting in the 20s. And do you see that as the only avenue? <clears throat> a lot of people were, I think, mildly surprised, even with a conservative Supreme Court, that they didn't take the recent case on redistricting and, in fact, um, chose not to make a ruling um, on political and racial issues involved in in redistricting that had made their way all the way up to them. And so it, it, it seems like the only recourse for, for the Democrats who most want redistricting, the Republicans don't want it, is they're going to have to win more seats and more governor's offices and do it state by state. For those states where it's a partisan process, that's absolutely correct, like here in Texas. Uh, for the states that are in there, more and more states doing the uh, nonpartisan panels or bipartisan panels to do this, um, it won't be as much of an issue. But in a state like Texas, if you want to draw the district lines, you have to take control of those institutions. I say that, you know, that only works to a certain point. Texas is very likely to pick up at least three congressional seats after the 2020 census, maybe even four. And there are federal laws in the books that talk about diluting minority voting power. And if it's a reality that those additional seats come from population growth in Texas in, let's say, the Latino community, then those extra seats are going to have to squeeze in somewhere. And I don't know this to be possible for Republicans to make all of those new seats Republican seats. If the growth is, is, is in Latino areas, then you're going to see uh, they, they might make Will Hurd's seat safe, but it's going to mean creating Latino majority districts in those parts of the states that have the most population growth. So there's only so much you can do with the demographics. But obviously having control of the machinery gives you an edge. Well, without a doubt. I'm really glad Joshua Schwartz put this question up because it's a subject I wanted to turn to, and that's in Florida. Florida's Amendment 4 passed and it enfranchises 1.4 million former felons, or I guess they're convicted felons, but uh, but but nevertheless, they they have served their their sentences. Given the margin of victory for President Trump in Florida in 2016 was 100,000 votes, uh, does this spell big changes for 2020? And I would add to Joshua's point, uh, Professor Crockett, that there's been and will continue to be a huge influx of Puerto Ricans moving into Florida in the wake of uh, the hurricanes there. And they probably are a, in, in the majority are Democratic voters as well. So Florida, which held red this time around, uh, we're still looking at some numbers coming in there. But um, uh, what, a, what about enfranchising felons and, and, and following the argument as it was successfully made in the campaign there, that if we want to reintegrate people fully into society, then that includes making them citizens in every respect. Yeah, I think most states do that. Florida was one of the more uh, draconian states in terms of refusing to give convicted felons who have served their sentence the, the right to vote. I think maybe you could petition to have it give it back to you. Uh, but obviously, population changes are, are a big deal when it comes to elections. If you just think of what happened with Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana, a bunch of people moved to Texas. Texas is a very, very red state, so it hasn't made the, hasn't made the state blue, but it did make Louisiana more red. So if you have an influx of people to Florida from Puerto Rico, if you have a, an influx of brand new voters at a fairly sizable, you know, probably a percentage point or two of the overall population in a state that's very tightly contested, that could be a big deal as well. Uh, and, and certainly Florida is ground zero in terms of uh, battleground states and 100,000 votes. Keeping in mind that not, not all of them will vote and not all of them will vote for Democrats, but you gotta figure that that's where 
the opportunity is for Democrats to perhaps push Florida uh, over that uh, balanced uh, level it is right now into more slightly blue territory. So that, that could be important. What's the law in Texas, Professor? I don't know, but I, do, I think we allow convicted felons to regain their voting rights. I just don't know if it's uh, automatic or not. Well, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know either, but I bet somebody out there in our Someone out audience there does. knows, we and, do. and we'll, hear, we'll hear from them shortly. Um, very interesting question here outside the immediate uh, numbers and results of Tuesday, and it comes from uh, a medical f- uh, doctor, a physician, John Buabud. If I'm saying your name right, if I'm not, I apologize. And it says, Dear Dr. Crockett, thanks for sharing your wisdom on our country's current political climate. I'm curious to hear your opinion on the significance of how our failed war on drugs on the future of our country and this administration. Mortalities resulting from opioid overdoses continue to rise. Our life expectancy has decreased for the first time in history. Attitudes across the country continue to change regarding cannabis as evidenced this month. Uh, It was just legalized all across Canada, by the way. The Journal of the American Medical Association published two articles this year indicating reduction in overdose deaths and opioid prescriptions in states that ended cannabis prohibition to differing degrees. How will President Trump's ambivalence on this issue shape his legacy in our future? That's a pretty broad um, uh, conversation to have, but on on the one hand, legalizing uh, marijuana uh, for recreational use and whether or not data is starting to emerge that that's reducing opioid uh, abuse and, and second of all just how the country seems to be floundering in general uh, dealing with this issue. So one of the arguments in favor of a federal system is that you can have some experiments at the state level, places like Colorado for example, and over time we can collect some data to see if these experiments are successful. The problem, of course, is the federalization of the, quote, war on drugs uh, has arguably led to less than stellar results. And for reasons that are probably personal, the president hasn't been inclined to follow the lead that a lot of people, even in his own party, would do, which is to look at uh, perhaps relaxing that campaign. Certainly the libertarian element of the Republican Party would be big fans of that. I know a lot of you know, the younger generation would be would welcome revisiting that as well. So there are forces in the Republican Party that would like to revisit both the question of incarceration and the war on drugs, uh, but the president has always been very staunch against that, and his former attorney general was as well. Whether the new attorney, acting attorney general or a future attorney general can be persuasive in the other direction, uh, I'm not sure how persuadable uh, Trump is, But that doesn't stop uh, states from moving forward on these things and uh, Congress from moving forward on these things. And I don't know that Trump would necessarily oppose some of these measures. Uh, But the more it is in the headlines, the more we talk about it, and the more possibility there is for progress. I'm just not sure I would look to the president for leadership on that issue because he does seem resistant to that. Um, and maybe disinterested in in, um, in in issues of that nature if uh, they take away from partisan politics. And I wonder whether or not you think, as a society, are we more divided or less divided after Tuesday? Are we more balanced or uh, pretty much where we were uh, before the elections? Obviously, the House has gone to Democratic control, and so uh, the Republicans will not control all three um, all three uh, aspects of the government in Washington, but nonetheless, it seems to me we remain a highly polarized society, and when you break down the votes between cities and the suburbs and rural areas, um, we're two different countries. It appears that way. Uh, We do measure polarization in political science, especially at the elite level, and there's no question that members of Congress have become more polarized steadily since the 1980s. Uh, our measurements would indicate that we are the most polarized at that level since the Civil War. And there's no sign that it's reversing. And nothing about what happened on Tuesday indicates a reversal because you had uh, people like Jeff Flake and Bob Corker leave office and they're replaced by people, well, we don't know about Arizona yet, uh, but replaced by people who uh, embraced Trump or moved toward Trump for the purposes of reelection. So um, George W. Bush was the most divisive president, the most polarizing president up to that time. Barack Obama beat him, and Trump is beating Obama. 
So there's no sign at the elite level that that is really changed. It's an open question in political science as to whether that's true in society. Some political scientists would argue vociferously that we are not really polarized as a nation. When you look at, it, at individual issues, there's remarkable common ground. But we've sorted ourselves very well so that people who are conservatives are now almost uniformly Republicans and people who are liberal are almost uniformly Democrats. If you go back to the 1970s, 60s, and 50s, there were liberal, moderate, and conservative Republicans and liberal, moderate, and conservative Democrats. So it wasn't hard to form cross-partisan coalitions to pass all sorts of interesting legislation. Now the parties are so far apart that the most liberal Republican senator is more conservative than the most conservative Democratic senator. And when you have that kind of a gap at the elite level, you begin to see your opposition, not as an opposition, but as an enemy. And it's hard then to push things forward, and that colors everything about Washington politics. Um, I don't think it can continue forever. At some point, that polarization has to kind of ratchet back some, but it may take a crisis or a trigger event to reshape the electorate and the elites, and I don't know what that looks like. And yet campaign professionals um, still believe that there's that independent middle voter or swing voter, if you will, who may go uh, back and forth between Republican and Democrat depending upon uh, the time and place and issue. And I've heard several Republican office holders in Washington say, uh, post-election, that given the robust state of the economy, uh, for them to lose that many House seats goes beyond the traditional midterm swing, and it's people directly responding negatively to President Trump's uh, rhetoric, his tweets, his, his polarizing uh, campaign style uh, speeches that he, that he does, and his um, denigration of the Democrats and people who disagree with him, uh, certainly his uh, constant attacks on the news media, et cetera. And that, in fact, people in that middle are joining with the Democrats in, in protest of that, that kind of behavior and, and don't want to see that kind of extreme rhetoric in, in the American political conversation. Yeah, midterms are oftentimes interpreted as referenda on the president. And because midterms usually are negative referenda, uh, we see a wide range of, uh, of um, results from midterm elections. And it doesn't have to be personal. Uh, Barack Obama lost big time 63 seats in the House in 2010, which has been interpreted as a negative referendum on Obamacare. And George W. Bush lost a lot of seats in 2006, which is perceived as a neg negative referendum on the war in Iraq. But it's interesting that in Trump's case, you do have this pretty low unemployment rate and a GDP that's been picking up, good jobs reports. And so it really is a question of tone and demeanor and style. That's what makes him unpopular and unpalatable for a lot of people. And we have debates in political science about what the independent voter is like. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that independent voters are people who deny their partisan affiliation but still vote consistently Republican or Democrat. But if they're willing to deny their partisan affiliation, then they're willing to consider voting for the opposite party if given a compelling case. In this case, it would be the unpopularity of a president because of tone or demeanor. And I think that's the risk that Republicans have with a president who although in his original campaign said he'll be the most presidential person in the country if he wins, has governed the way he campaigned, which is a style that is hard hitting and boorish and rude, uh, even accepting accomplishments that the administration has achieved. So uh, I think that's a valid concern for Republicans. Let's talk a little bit about money and politics and um, certainly the widely held uh, perception uh, after the Supreme Court ruling that dark money would take over uh, politics at the national and state level. And yet Beto O'Rourke, who, uh, you know, he swore off political action committee money and, and uh, um, really, really put together uh, in the beginning just a flood of, of smaller donations. He raised more money, I think, in the last quarter than any Senate candidate in any state in history had raised. And um, a... Uh, uh, graduate of Trinity 1959, William Souter, Bill Souter says, uh, discussing that Cruz O'Rourke race, um, 
look at the huge difference spent on the race by the candidates. And would O'Rourke, Congressman O'Rourke, have done so well without the millions donated, especially the millions donated from out of state? In fact, the majority of his money, I, can, I believe, came from out of state. Well, at one point, and this is late summer, so it's not the last quarter, you know, about a third of his money came from out of state. But I'm sure, given how much came in afterwards, and part of that's an effa- a fact of who he's running against. Uh, we saw some of this back in 2000 when Hillary Clinton ran for the Senate against Ned Lamont. A lot of money from both parties nationwide flowed into New York because if you're a Republican, you think that Hillary Clinton is the spawn of Satan, and if you're a Democrat, she's the one who's the savior. Uh, so acknowledging Cruz's problematic uh, reputation, <laughs> Uh, he does draw a lot of attention nationwide, and uh, O'Rourke was the beneficiary of that. What I tell my students, though, is that money is a necessary condition for political success, but not a sufficient condition. So this was the most expensive Senate race in American history, and O'Rourke outperformed Cruz in terms of raising money both in-state and out-of-state. He still fell a little bit less than 3% short. So money does not guarantee victory. He's still running in a red state against a red candidate, and that was too much ultimately to overcome. Um, I do suspect that if the money were a lot less, he would not have been able to run the kind of campaign that he wanted to. So what the money allowed him to do was run a professional-style campaign throughout the entire state. He did not have to worry about what it took to field a statewide infrastructure. That's what makes him competitive. But every dollar after that point becomes less important, and there are just some natural advantages baked in there for Cruz. So the money helped him run that kind of a campaign. It was not ultimately enough for him to win, and I don't think $10 million more million would have helped him do that either. And yet it seems in almost every level of politics, whether it's presidential campaigns, statewide races, or even local races here in San Antonio and Bear County, uh, each cycle, we seem to amp up the amount of spending it takes to accomplish the same thing. And can we talk about San Antonio politics for just a little <laughs> bit before we we conclude the program? Because we had some very interesting things happen on the Bear Cow- County ballot, regardless of, of where you, where you live in the county, San Antonio or one of the other municipalities. Um, certainly in San Antonio, the the uh, you know the the main battle was between the firefighters' unions and the three charter amendments they placed on there and um, the city and establishment, um, including yours truly, that, that oppose those uh, three propositions. Anyone who's run a campaign will tell you it's very hard to get people to vote no on propositions. We've all been ingrained all our lives to vote yes. Uh, voters voted no on Proposition A. They overwhelmingly voted yes on Proposition B, uh, limiting the future city manager, putting term limits on it, and limiting that individual's uh, compensation. And they na- very narrowly approved uh, um, Proposition C, which will probably mean that we go to arbitration on a contract after a four-year standoff with the fire union. Um, However, the business community, which traditionally will tell you, boy, we need to raise a million dollars to run a campaign in San Antonio, that turned into two million and that turned into 2.2 million. The firefighters union that we know of, of, out of their own pockets, probably spent 1.2 million more from their national uh, affiliates. We'll see at the end of the day how much they spent. That's an extraordinary amount of money for a race that didn't involve a candidate right. or an office. No, it is pretty remarkable. What I find interesting is that given the way those campaigns were uh, prosecuted, I would have expected all three propositions to win or lose. And we had this very interesting split decision, and I'm going to have to default back to the political science wisdom, which is that a lot of people who vote are not closely connected to the details. And as much as we saw ads and signs, and I got flyers in the mail and things like that, I think a lot of people went into the voting booth and said, oh, we've got some propositions. I have to read these. Proposition A was somewhat opaque. It requires some discussion of what it really means. It seems somewhat complicated, thresholds and things like that. And this, the one I think not accidentally failed, whereas oh, sure, we should have arbitration for people who disagree and that squeak over the uh, finish line. And then on B, people read something and think 10 times the salary sounds good to me. I don't like people making too much money if they're in public office. I don't think it was a negative referendum on this current city manager. I think people just read that. And for a lot of people, it just made intuitive sense that this is a decent threshold. And of course, I like term limits. And (laughs) 
I hate to uh, criticize my fellow citizens, but I, I, I don't know how much uh, thought went into some of those votes. Obviously, a certain faction wanted to pass, and a certain faction wanted to not pass, to, to fail. Uh, but a lot I think of people, this, a lot of people in the middle. I think the split decision is people reading the propositions and just making a decision there on the ground. And it wouldn't surprise me if the city leadership goes back and tries to figure out, well, how do we interpret this and is there a way to reverse it in a future election? Since if Cheryl Scully stays on for a while, she's not impacted by Proposition B. Um, they have that opportunity once every two years yeah. to amend the city charter. And, it will and be maybe educate people on what the stakes are for hiring a qualified city manager running one of the top ten cities in the country. Or, as I've heard some mutterings out there, going to a strong mayor system, which uh, is a whole other animal. Well, we, it'll be a presidential election, too, if they do put something on the, uh, the next ballot for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, wanted to ask you a little bit about what your thoughts are about Texas changing the law on uh, judicial candidates having to run as partisan candidates. And um, the Democrats just swept through the Bear County Courthouse on Beto's coattails, and Republican judges, for better or worse, and there were some very good ones and maybe not some very good ones, it didn't matter at the end of the day, you were just swept out. If the Democrats had known Beto was going to have that kind of effect, I think there were seven judicial seats in the primary they didn't even file candidates for it because right. they thought the Republicans were strong enough to hold. They'd be gone too if the Democrats had had a candidate because people were just lever pulling. And uh, that doesn't seem to bode well for our system. Uh, on the one hand, there was a very, I thought, uh, well-campaigned, well-contended fight for the district attorney's office after Nico LaHood lost in the primary to his Democratic challenger, who eventually prevailed. But people don't know who the judges are. They don't recognize the names. It's impossible at that level to gain name recognition for yourself sure. in the community, and yet we just continue to sweep them in and out. Right. It all depends on who's being advantaged in that year. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I... Will speak as a confirmed federalist in terms of the 1780s on this question, which is I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense to have partisan elections for judges. And we do here in Texas from the lowest level all the way to the Texas Supreme Court. And uh, we can have an argument about that, that level, but most people are not going to be able to invest the time and effort that you need to study all the issues for all the races for two dozen or more judgeships. And so if there is a wave in one direction, it's, you know, then you end up just purging the entire judicial branch of people, many of whom are well qualified, and then two years later the opposite happens, which doesn't strike me as sensible for sound administration of the judicial system. So I would be very much a fan of revisiting this question and looking at what other states do when it comes to either nonpartisan elections or have some kind of appointment system with uh, retention elections and provide for a more professional staffing of the judicial branch with qualified judges that have some level of job security when they're doing well and still give some power to the people. But I don't know that we are that equipped, and I include myself in that category, to uh, study all of those issues for all those races, for all those candidates. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me and defies everything we know in political science about voters willingness, if not ability, to manage that process. Well, it's a challenge for everyone. And, you know, we talk about robust voter turnout in this midterm election, but the fact is if you take the ballot apart piece by piece, at the top voter turnout was extraordinary for a midterm. Yeah. But then we get into the so-called undercount, and when you get down to those judicial races, which are usually at the bottom of the ballot, in this case the propositions were at the very bottom, right. uh, the numbers I saw were as many as 26,000 people choosing not to vote, which meant they were either confused, uh, they were fatigued by the time they got to yeah. the 16th screen of the computer, or right. they just didn't understand the issues and didn't want to try to understand them inside the ballot box. But are you concerned about the undervote, per se, of uh, that dimension? You're always going to get some kind of roll-off, and that's not unusual. But with so many important seats at stake, that would be unfortunate. I imagine the people who didn't are the people who pulled straight ticket. And so that's easy to do and actually not an unintelligent thing to do if you belong to a, one of the two tribes. Uh, but again, that still then leads to this persistent pattern of 
purging that branch every two years, every four years of people who are qualified judges because it happens to be an Obama year or Trump year or a midterm election year. Uh, and so that's just evidence of the fact that a lot of people don't have the time, money, or resources to figure out all the issues for all the candidates for all these races. I mean, 16 pages, and most of us can handle a few races, but I don't do that kind of work. <laughs> well, I don't have time. <laughs> you know, we started the Rivard Report seven years ago because uh, so much was happening in San Antonio, and still is. And I think uh, we've had the same perception many had that with gridlock in Washington and one party uh, domination at the state level, that cities, uh, not just in Texas, but across the country, were really where all the action is, where a lot of things are getting done, where uh, most of the job creation, economic growth, population growth is occurring. Uh, people expect us to grow by one million people uh, over the next 25 years. Uh, that's pretty breathtaking. Do you see uh, city politics becoming, even if not in name, in indeed more partisan uh, when you look at issues like the firefighters versus uh, the city council and the mayor and the city manager or some of the rhetoric that's that's coming out, let's say, between Mayor Nuremberg and, and Councilman Brockhouse on the one hand, it, it almost seems to be coming increasingly more um, Tea Party Republican in a way versus Democrat and a perception, certainly in Austin, where the legislature will, for the third consecutive session, will attempt to reduce the power of home rule cities. Uh, they did it on annexation and, um, and ride share uh, the last uh, session. There's talk about making sure cities don't get taxing authority over everything from scooters to Airbnb and that the state per capture that. Um, how do you see things working out between the state and the city and even within the city of whether or not we're in fact becoming more partisan even if, if candidates aren't running with party affiliation? Yeah, it's hard to be easily partisan when you don't have that label behind your name. Although if we went to a strong mayor system, I think that would probably be those would be partisan elections. Mm -hmm. uh, but the polarization that you see at the partisan level at, nationwide certainly permeates state level politics. And that has the potential to go down to the lower level. And this is interesting because I think you're absolutely right that as the federal government is increasingly incapable of managing certain problems, the burden does fall to the states and localities to do that because that's where a lot of power and creativity lies. Uh, in fact, if you look at all the policy areas state and local politics actually has responsibility for, it comprises most of the things that make our lives pleasant or miserable. <laughs> and so there's a lot to be said for what states and local governments can and cannot do in that area. Uh, so if the polarization you see at the national level begins to permeate the state level, that could certainly be uh, problematic, uh, although it would be interesting to, to do a comparison of large cities that have a partisan breakdown and see how they perform compared to what we do. Why, why, why do some cities, uh, you know, some cities evolved to a city manager council government and others involved, uh, evolved to be strong mayor government. There's always been the perception that the strong mayor uh, uh, system is, is political, is partisan, is more subject to machine politics, even corruption, that the city manager council government is uh, more professional, more managerial and administrative, yep. but people will also point to, to the fact that cities of a certain size, uh, once you reach a certain population level, they're all strong mayors. San Antonio continues to grow. I don't call it the seventh largest city, but but uh, we are continuing to grow and, and, and uh, there is a little bit of talk about maybe we ought to look at the other system. Um, why did some cities become one way and others another? Well, I think we're the largest city that doesn't have a strong mayor system, and that may be a fact. Uh, it, it, it's a reform movement to go to a more professional style. Uh, this really begins in the progressive era at the turn of the 20th century with the sense that parties are bad and they're infested with corruption and vice, and so you want to have a more scientific uh, sense of governance, and you do that through professional management. And San Antonio, and I don't know, know the history of San Antonio well enough to know when that happened in the city, but that is where that, mo that move came from. Uh, so the question is whether that works well for the city or do you move on to what New York and LA and Chicago do? Uh, 
uh, and that's something that's going to require a long conversation. Well, we only have one minute, but I want to give Monique Carrion the last word. Um, as both political parties fight over their own identity and future, after this election, do you see a third party starting to be a bigger player in elections? All my libertarian and green students ask me that, and <laughs> um, the last successful third party movement was the Republicans in the 1850s when the two major parties couldn't handle the slavery issue. If we have one issue that divides the country along sectional lines that extremely, I can imagine a situation where that happens, but I haven't seen evidence yet that the Libertarian or Green parties are making that kind of an inroad. Nothing to say couldn't happen. I mean, both parties face really interesting stress fractures in the next couple of years as they figure out what their identity is in a Trump era. Uh, but uh, I tend to be more conservative in my political science on predicting the death of one of the two parties and the rise of a third party alter alternative. Well, Al Gore would certainly tell you that, uh, Ross, not Ross Perot, but uh, Ralph Nader certainly had enough success, at least yeah. in, in one state in particular, to affect the outcome. So. Yeah, they can affect an outcome. That's <laughs> no true. No doubt about it. Well, thanks so much for attending this webinar, everyone out there near and far. The next webinar is scheduled for November 30th after Thanksgiving. That'll be at noon Central Standard Time, and it'll be on a totally different topic. Um, Zombies are putting my kids through college. It's a live webinar conversation with author Joe McKinney, class of 92 at Trinity University with President Danny Anderson, who's a great fan of Joe McKinney's zombie fiction. Who knew? And uh, the two of them will be on uh, November 30th, so don't miss that one. And Professor Crockett, thanks so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to spend an hour with you. Enjoyed it very much.